had moved into Lebanon County. And last week, the Derry Township supervisors raised local taxes by 37 percent. My South London Derry folks have kept taxes at an even level. <laughs> Uh, at the risk of sounding like such a Republican, that, that's a good thing. <laughs> so, so thank you very much, and thank you for the commissioner's work and uh, all of the good stuff that goes on in Lebanon County. I'm pleasantly surprised by all of the opportunities and all of the uh, good things in this county. Uh, so it's an easy transition from my original home in western Pennsylvania to Indian Town Gap to being a part of state government uh, to a um, kind of a, a very pleasant, quiet life that I expect to have for the next oh, 150 years or so. So uh, anyway, just real quickly, I, a couple of thoughts I was having driving out here uh, today. Uh, I just want to tell the, the story in Ronald Reagan's first term in office. I know you're all too young to remember this, of course, um, but uh, our embassy in Beirut, Lebanon, was attacked, and 212, 212 Marines, America's finest, were just murdered in a bombing attack on the embassy because it happens, because embassies in this dangerous world are dangerous places and things like that. President Reagan picked up the phone to Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, and he said, look, I guess uh, you, you guys are going to have a field day with this. There are going to be investigations, and you're going to have to put up a lot of political nonsense. Tip O'Neill said, Mr. President, you didn't kill those boys. We're going to have one hearing and put this to bed. And that's what they did. Another story, real quickly. In 2008, in the election between Barack Obama and John McCain, uh, I was watching TV in a town hall setting, and uh, there were a lot of folks who were asking a lot of questions and things like that, and McCain was handling it pretty well. A woman jumps up and says, there's no way that we can vote for that Barack Obama. I don't even know if he's an American. You know he's a Muslim, and he just wasn't even born here, and things like that. To which McCain said, ma'am, stop. We don't agree on much, but he's a good family man. He's a Christian. Those two stories tell what leadership should be about. That's how politics works in this country. That's the give and take and the collegiality that has been the hallmark of elections ever since I've been involved in politics. The recent election, um, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, should leave a very bad taste in your mouth. Adlai Stevenson once said that uh, the toughest thing about running for president was winning the office without proving that you are unworthy of it. Because it's true. Words matter. Elections matter. Your behavior matters. And we were treated to such a relentlessly bad campaign of personal attack and innuendo. I, I want people to know, particularly young people, that that's not the way it works. That's not the way it's supposed to happen. You, you win or lose in politics, and it can be a very rough business. But you don't cross the line into inflammatory statements, uh, absolute false hoods, um, fear and hatred are not legitimate campaign tactics. It ought to be about aspiration. It ought to be about showing folks what direction you can take the country, about good ideas and things like that. That's how you move forward. So we're in a situation where there was a huge outpouring of discontent because one of the candidates used it as a weapon figured out that you can get to people viscerally, and rather than appeal intellectually, you appeal on the gut level. Everybody's known that for a long time, but this is the first campaign that ever really perfected the art of uh, utilizing negatives in such a way that it turned out a huge outpouring of angry voters on election day. 
I would prefer to motivate people by uh, hope rather than by fear. But fear is a potent weapon, and that's where we are today. And the result is that uh, we're all kind of on pins and needles, wondering what's going to happen next. Uh, and it's a, it's a very dangerous world. Yesterday was, you know, the same time that uh, Donald Trump was being elected by the Electoral College, the ambassador from Russia was killed in Turkey. I understand that when that happens, that is that close to war, because what would we do if one of our ambassadors was killed overseas? There would be recriminations uh, and there's going to be something very bad that happens as a result of that. While that is going on, the reason for the killing was that there's genocide going on in Syria. And that's a powder keg that's about to explode as well. There are comments that have been made already by the president-elect regarding China that are incendiary and dangerous. Uh, and there are some intimations that Russia itself is looking to mobilize in Europe again because of some of the statements with regard to NATO. Uh, this is, be, be very, very careful. Uh, here's the thing. We're all Americans. We all believe in this country. And it is our duty, it is our duty to give the president the benefit of the doubt and to say we support the president uh, and we hope that he succeeds because then America succeeds. However, that does not relieve you of your obligation to be thoughtful Americans, to stand up when things are not right, and to not give away basic core principles of justice and fairness and compassion and decency and equality. Those are things that we believe in. And you just can't trample over people's rights in your zeal to make America in your image, whatever that is. America's a pretty great country. We've always been great, you know? So we have to cling to that ability to continue to make it great as good citizens. Stand up and be heard if you feel something's wrong, because this will pass. And I think. America is strong enough to withstand even the kind of um, uh, the kind of um, wholesale negative attack of the campaign that we just got through. Okay, got that on my system. <laughs> um, the reason for the book, in part, was to make that point that there was a time when cooperation was the order of the day. There's always been spirited competition that goes back to, you know, Jefferson versus Adams. Uh, we've had rough campaigns and we've had interactions between the parties over the years that got a little dangerous and personal and all that kind of thing. But when it came right down to it, in my experience, the overwhelming majority of folks who were elected by you were in it to do the right thing and were willing to put the good of the people before the good of themselves or their party. And it happened to me. In 1993, I was sitting as the lieutenant governor, happily cutting ribbons, you know, going to events, uh, enjoying the position, when uh, Governor Casey suddenly goes to the hospital with an unprecedented double organ transplant procedure. Um, so there I am going from kind of ceremonial to writing billion dollar checks and making decisions uh, that affect 13 million people. Um, and um, because I took the job seriously from the start, I had prepared myself for that moment and I knew who the cabinet members were, I knew what was happening in all of the various agencies. So when I kind of took the oath, um, I was ready to move forward in, uh, in Casey's style. He was still the governor, and I didn't know if he was going to be back in five days, ten days, or six months, or six years. Um, but I had to kind of move forward because he was definitely out of commission. So I was, at the same time, the lieutenant governor, the acting governor, the president of the Senate in a body that was split 25-25, so I had the deciding vote on some key procedural matters that determined control 
of that body, and I was also considered the leading candidate for governor in the next year. So all of those brought some baggage and some attacks, and the book is about the, uh, the extraordinary pressures that were brought to bear all at that particular moment in our history and how we kind of slugged through it. <clears throat> it's a, a <clears throat> pretty honest uh, critique of uh, the relationship that I had with the governor. Uh, by and large, it was very good. I admired Bob Casey very much, and I still think that he was one of the most uh, outstanding leaders Pennsylvania has ever had. But we didn't agree on everything. I used to tell people that uh, we have a good relationship and we agree on uh, most things except little things, like my future, for example. Um, and uh, uh, we did have some political differences that uh, we never quite ironed out. And I talk about it in the book, but by and large, I hope, if and when you get a chance to read it, uh, you'll see that it's kind of a testimonial to a good man and my job being the sidekick. And after we go through the entire year of ups and downs and the specifics of the schedule that I had to keep and some of the challenges I faced in the Senate and maybe uh, from some of the political uh, actors at the time, uh, it comes to a conclusion at the end saying it was a pretty good run and it was an exhilarating experience uh, and there are lessons to be learned. And the lessons are know what you're doing, be prepared, be kind, you know, be careful of uh, uh, being negative to people because it does come back to haunt you. So in a sense, Maybe the book is kind of like an antidote to uh, uh, the negative feelings that people are having about our, our uh, government and our politics. There's a, uh, a couple of interesting stories in there. For example, um, in uh, 1991, we had just won re-election, and the governor, Governor Casey, had invested $5 million in television ads saying, we're the rising star and we haven't raised your taxes and things are going well. Only to discover that in the last quarter of 1990, the bottom fell out, much like we had in 2008. We were a billion dollars in the hole and we had nowhere of getting that money. We didn't have gaming revenues, we didn't have Marcella Shale revenues. We needed to get a billion dollars. So I was the emissary, went over to my Republican friends in the Senate and said, folks, we're six votes short here. We've already beaten the Democrats up. They're going to make a very difficult vote and vote for a massive tax increase. I need six votes from you guys. And the conversation was pretty blunt. <laughs> uh, and it was, you know we're going to use this and pound you on this. You know the position of the Republicans are against taxes. So we're going to go out there and use this like a weapon against you and all of the Democratic candidates. I said, yeah, I get it, I get it, but can I have six votes? <clears throat> well, you know that we need some things, so if we give you the votes for this billion dollars, we want another billion five in um, projects that we've been trying to get for our side of it. The bottom line is that by making the commitment, by having decent relations, by understanding politics, we shook hands, they provided six votes, we passed the tax package, we stabilized the economy of Pennsylvania, and we moved on in a positive sense. So it can be done on even something as thorny as massive tax increases. You know, nobody likes taxes, but guess what? Every now and then it has to be done. So those kind of things recur in the book, and uh, uh, it, it is about uh, working productively in a noble profession of politics, because I, I still think it is. I think uh, make sure you teach your children that uh, if they want to get into public service, they should. They should go in for the right reasons. They should uh, struggle to be fair and honest. Uh, and uh, don't beat the other guy up too much, because the other guy is just like you, just coming from a different perspective. So that's kind of the tone and the direction. 
The other thing is I wanted my grandchildren to know that I actually was on the planet. <laughs> so, so this is my, my way of saying, hey, I actually worked for a living at one point. And uh, it really does contain a lot of uh, interesting anecdotes about schedules and people I've met and things. I'll, I'll share just one more and then shut up and answer whatever questions you may have. I'm sitting at the desk as the acting governor in um, the fall of 1993. And the phone rings, and the voice on the phone says, it's the White House. I said, oh, okay, whatever. I figured it was somebody playing a joke, <laughs> calling. Um, but sure enough, I pick up the phone, and it's Bill Clinton, the president. And he says, uh, hey, Mark, how, how you doing, Mark? That's pretty good. How long did you fine. practice? <laughs> I said, fine. And uh, we chatted for a little bit, and I, I knew him, and we had interacted a couple of times before. How's Jackie? How the kids? That's good. Good time. And then he got to the uh, issue at hand, and uh, he said, uh, we're going to have this vote in Congress on this uh, North American free, tr free Trade Agreement, this NAFTA you probably heard about. And in fact, I had heard about it, and uh, I was nervous about it, and I had asked my members of the cabinet to give me their view of it. <clears throat> the Secretary of Agriculture loved it because we were going to sell a whole lot more farm products to Mexico. Uh, the Secretary of Labor and Industry and Commerce hated it because we were going to lose manufacturing jobs probably for the next 20 or 25 years. I came from western Pennsylvania and saw the devastation in the steel industry and uh, so he asked me, would you uh, round up votes from your congressional delegation to get this done? And I said, uh, uh, no, Mr. President, I'm opposed to it. I said, and we're going to ask the delegation to uh, vote no. So if you want to pass NAFTA, you're going to have to get the votes from Oklahoma or Texas or something like that. Dead silence on the phone. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I just ticked off the President of the United States. Uh, but he gets back on and says, that's what I thought you'd say, Mark. I realized he was just kind of testing me. He knew that it wasn't good for Pennsylvania, uh, but he also thought that maybe he could push me into accepting it. And because I was prepared and done my homework and things like that, I was able, as one of my one of my key <laughs> uh, accomplishments, was to say no to the President of the United States in the interest of Pennsylvania. And it was the right thing to do. And it's so funny to listen to all the give and take in last year's election about free trade and so on. On that particular issue, I do think that uh, that particular agreement hurt us rather than helped us. Not the country. Probably helped the country. But it hurt Pennsylvania very badly. So anyway, I was 20-some years ago in the middle of that discussion. Uh, and there are a whole host of other little things that we are involved in that have come to fruition that I'm quite proud of uh, with regard to energy uh, and housing and uh, the environment and what have you. Those are things that we started in that six and a half months when I was uh, acting governor. So there you have it. Uh, it was a good run. I ran for governor in 94 and lost, uh, but uh, it, was a, uh, it was a hotly contested race. And you win and you lose. And you dust yourself off and you continue to be good citizens. So my bottom line exhortation to you is be good citizens. That's important. Well, thank you. You want to vote for people who want to do good things for people. Uh, and uh, there are folks out there that are good people on both sides of the aisle. So your job as a citizen is to separate the bad from the good and to figure out who you really believe in, who aligns with your philosophy, and do something to help them. Don't, don't be afraid to stick your neck out and raise money and volunteer and things like that because it's necessary. America, you know, the whole republic depends on the uh, informed consent of the governed. So get informed and consent and be a part of the process. That's my final exhortation.